In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was with God in the beginning. Everything came into being through the Word, and without the Word, nothing came into being. What came into being through the Word was life, and the life was the light for all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness doesn't extinguish the light. A man named John was sent from God. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light, so that through him everyone would believe in the light. He himself wasn't the light, but his mission was to testify concerning the light. The true light that shines on all people was coming into the world. The light was in the world, and the world came into being through the light. But the world didn't recognize the light. The light came to his own people, and his own people didn't welcome him. But those who did welcome him, those who believed in his name, he authorized to become God's children, born not from blood, nor from human desire or passion, but born from God. The word became flesh and made his home among us. We have seen his glory, glory like that of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified about him crying out, this is the one of whom I said, he who comes after me is greater than me because he existed before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. As the law was given through Moses, so grace and truth came into being through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, God the only son who is at the father's side has made God known. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Will you pray with me? God of love and God of life, this is your time and we are your people. Open our hearts and our minds and our lives to your presence that we would hear your word and respond with all that we are. Amen. So to begin the summer, we as a church have wanted to have these conversations around community and welcome and grace. And for us to be about those things, we wanted to know where does that all start for us? Where do we begin And that answer is in God. And so last week we had this conversation around God who creates, God as that parent who brings life, who made everything, including you and me in the universe, how we relate to that God, how we find that God, how we see that God revealed throughout scripture and in our lives. And this week we continue that conversation talking about how God is known in that expression of Jesus Christ, uh, the Redeemer, but so much more. Yes, Redeemer from Sin and brokenness, but also savior from those things, one who heals, one who brings life, one who forgives, one who makes us whole. And so in one sermon, in just a few minutes, I'm going to reveal to you everything you need to know about Jesus. Probably not. Probably not. There are a lot of folks here in this room who've probably been living this road and walking faith longer than I've been alive, and you have been seeking Christ longer than I. You could probably give this sermon better than me. But I hope to uh, have a conversation this morning around the things that we find essential in who Christ is and how Christ is God with us, God's expression among us, and what that means for our hope and our future. So to begin this conversation about Jesus, I just have a a simple question, and no, this is not rhetorical. Who is Jesus to us? And he steps down the stairs, and he invites. Who is Jesus to you, to me? Who is Jesus? Love. Love. Hope. Hope. A A teacher, compassion. Strength, faith, peace, what was that? Faith, grace, grace, yes. What else? Example. Example. Companion. Friend, loving. 
Who else is Jesus to us? Nice? Savior? Connection to God? Listener? Caring? Caring? Humility. Humility. Is there more? Yeah, compassion. Yeah. What? Healer. Healer. Sacrifice. Sacrifice. Forgiveness. Did I hear something else? Uniter. This is great. We have this huge huge number of things we've already said and this is also great because sometimes I guess when it's personal we feel a little shy about sharing sometimes and we're talking about Jesus and something else it's like oh yes yes Jesus is so good Jesus is so many things yes let's talk about Jesus not about me let's talk about Jesus is there anything else you would add to who Jesus is to you Jesus is Jesus that's right that's deeper than we think probably Oh, man, this is such a beautiful place to start, I think, to hear all of these, be it attributes or ideas, compassion, peace, grace, teacher, example, strength. I think it's yes, it's both and, it's all of it. Uh, This is the impossible task we try every week here, to connect to this person who is so much and yet still walked inside of flesh and bone like you and me. Uh, There's a reason in the complexity of who Jesus is that we have 2,000 years of people trying to make sense of this man's life and death and resurrection. And as many different things that were named in this room, we've had as many more named for as many Christians that have walked this earth and even non-Christians who have encountered Christ and what he meant to the world. And to make sense of just who Christ is is more complex than just to boil it down to just one thing or just one idea or just this is the most important thing about Jesus. We have so many different churches and denominations and ways of worshiping and being because Christ means so much to so many. And so... I give you thanks for offering your experience and what it means, and I hope that maybe you heard something else that you hadn't thought of before in the room. And I hope that maybe we ask some more questions of what else Christ could be to us. Who else could Christ be to us? The Gospel of John gives us a pretty rich beginning as we encounter what Christ is. This text was... Some people think an early hymn of the Christian faith to wrap our heads around the fact that Jesus was a man who did so much, but so much more than just another human being. That his connection is deep and abiding with the God who created everything. So when it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, it's meant to take you back to some of those words we read a week ago, that in the beginning was God. And Christ was right there. That being of love and community that created everything is also expressed in this person of Christ. John has stirred up a lot because not every gospel said those same things about Jesus, that Jesus was with God and Jesus is God. And that's part of what we're trying to unpack. How could a person be God among us? And what would that mean for us, that God is a person who walked among us? And that hope of who God is that I talked about last week, that God is this force of love and community. Christ is that in flesh and bone. What we talked about last week of what if God is a song and it's not so much as the song playing or not. The question is, are we playing in tune as our lives are living the song? Christ shows us what the song is like. Christ lives perfectly in tune in everything he does. 
And so Christ is, yes, that example, that teacher, but also Christ is that encourager, that one who comes alongside and says, hey, here's maybe where that note's a little flat, a little sharp, a little, a little not quite in harmony. Here's maybe a different way to do it. Christ is to us that understandable form of all that God is. So what does it mean for God to be in Christ? And what does that mean for us? Um, we look to the Bible for these things, yes? This is, again, these Sunday school answers. What's the answer today, Jesus? Where do we find out about Jesus? In the Bible, because the Bible tells me so. Uh, and maybe it is that simple at the end of the day that Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, and yet we can't seem to get that right enough in our world. In four Gospels, we have four different pictures of who Christ is and what it means for Christ to be God. It's that simple, right? <laughs> tell, me what, tell me what God is like in Christ. Okay, well, we're going to need four entire stories of this man's life because it is so complex and rich. In the Gospel of Matthew, he is this rich teacher who brings wisdom to us to help us learn, to help us grow. He brings so much hope to us in the way that he loves. In the Gospel of Mark, he is like a rescuer. That song we sang to begin worship, that is so much the idea in the Gospel of Mark that that community of faith saw that humanity was lost and kidnapped and captured by evil forces and sin. And so Christ comes to unbind us from evil that he is the redeemer paying our debt and setting us free. But then in the Gospel of Luke, we get one who comes to save, and by that I mean the literal sense, to heal and make whole. And over and over again in the Gospel of Luke, we have stories of healing, stories of reconciliation, of mending broken relationships and mending broken hearts. And in John, we have this poetic, mystical image that Jesus is, yes, teacher. Yes, one who fights against the forces of darkness wherever they are. Yes, this healer who brings in the lost and welcomes all. But it is absolutely the force of creation at work among us. God among us. God with us. Bringing light. Bringing life. It is all of it. That in Christ, we have our beginning and our living and our ending. All of our lives, all of our identity, as rooted in God as we hope to be, it means to be rooted in Christ. Every moment of every day. What does it mean to get my sense of self from who Christ is, how Christ is the song of God in tune, how Christ is God moving into our neighborhood, living among us. That's a phrase Eugene Peterson says in the message interpretation of this text where it says, the word became flesh and made his home among us. God moves into our neighborhood to live alongside us to share a meal alongside us, to hear our stories. And all the things that Christ does for all of those people and all of those wonderful stories in Scripture are offered to us as well. Are you longing for a place to belong? Christ has a community for you. Are you hungry for a meal? Christ has food and sustenance for you. Are you looking for a relationship of hope and love and a place there, where you have been outcast, then God has love for you and grace for you and hope for you in Christ. Are you looking for that second chance as over and over and over again that is offered in Scripture, that is offered to you and I? We'll talk more about this next week in, with the Holy Spirit because that is also a, such an easy thing to discuss in 2018. Uh, but Christ says over and over again and throughout the Gospels that he is still with us. When two or three are gathered in his name, he is with us. When we share this meal that we'll share later in our worship together, Christ is with us, yes, in the bread and in the cup, 
but in each of us as we offer grace and receive grace. As I try to digest all of these big ideas, because these are a lot of big ideas, uh, I find myself rooted in the words that Christ said about himself in the Gospel of Luke. Um, When it says that God moves into our neighborhood in Christ, this is what I think that means. At the beginning of his ministry in the Gospel of Luke, Christ goes to the synagogue and reads these words from Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to preach good news for the poor, to proclaim release of the prisoner and recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You want to know what it looks like for God to move into our neighborhood for all that God is to be the grounding of our identity and the light post for our community? What the song sounds like in tune? Christ says it right here about his work. This is, in many ways, his mission and vision statement about his ministry. If I'm playing in tune with the song, then my life has got to be good news for the poor. If I'm playing in tune with the song, my life has got to be proclaiming release for those who are captives. My life has got to be proclaiming light and sight for those who cannot see. My life has got to be about liberation for those who are experiencing oppression. My life has got to be about the year of the Lord's favor, which is this wonderful idea called Jubilee, where it's not just a positive year of yes and good motivation and positive thinking. It is a year of forgiving debts, a year of returning what is not yours, a year of rest and recovery, a year of reconciliation. I think in many ways, our world is still in deep need of this song of God in Christ. I think in a lot of ways, uh, so many churches offer good news to the poor, but do I wake up in the morning and ask, is my life a blessing for others? And not just because I'm a nice guy who asks how people are doing today, but am I invested in the well-being and thriving of my neighbors? Is their thriving caught up in my thriving? That's a way I choose to be rooted in Christ and the love of God every day. Is my life rooted in the release of those who are captives? There are literal people who are captives in our world be it from crimes that they have committed, yes. John Wesley took this so seriously that so much of his time was spent visiting prisons to be a presence of hope for those who might never know freedom in this life. To those who have just come to our country seeking a new life of hope and are finding themselves detained. Are we good news for those who are captives? Or are we defined by another set of values, another set of rules, another set of human relationships that says my citizenship matters more than my humanity? That's part of that tension of the song I'm trying to sing with my life and what Christ has said. This is what the song sounds like. Am I living a life where I'm waking up every day and asking Maybe not so much how am I helping others see who are blind, but where am I blind first? And Christ has a lot to say about that. I I would really like to go looking at the speck in my neighbor's eye and removing that splinter when I've got a log in my own that is keeping me from seeing. I know I'm guilty of having a myopic tunnel vision view of the world, of what is good for me, what works for me, what's comfortable for me, what are my needs right now. And I need to be given a much broader vision beyond my own experience and my limited view of the world. Where is my life singing that song of Christ that is offering a life of freedom and liberation for my neighbors? You may be needing that song of liberation in your life because oppression takes so many forms. It may be 
the oppression of the rules of the culture we live in that say you're never going to be good enough unless, unless, unless you make enough, you achieve enough, you do enough. We need liberation from that oppression. We still in 2018 live in a world in the United States of America where there is physical oppression for those who don't hit a threshold of income, who don't have the right color of skin, who don't love the right person and are discriminated against for any of these things or don't have the right citizenship status, be whatever it is. One of the things I've learned from neighbors of mine living in different situations of me is that I don't get to define oppression if I am fine with the situation. Part of my recovering of sight for me is learning how to listen to the pain of my neighbors and know that Christ probably has more in common with them than me. The one who lived as a brown-skinned man in the Middle East who probably was closer to the poverty line than I've ever been, who was not a citizen in his own country and empire, who did not have a vote, did not have a voice, and yet still gave his entire life for others to be healed, for others to be welcomed, for others to have a place of home. Where am I called to be that presence of blessing and hope and grace for others who are longing for a welcome, longing for a voice, longing for wholeness, if I am able to provide that blessing, that may very well be me playing the song in tune the way Christ has lived it and offered it first. Am I choosing to live in the year of the Lord's favor and bring that to my neighbors? Do I hang on to my debts and grudges Do I hang on to those who have wronged me and hold them accountable to that with punishment, with anger, with vengeance? Or do I hear that song of forgiveness? Part of the theology we have received over the millennia of following Christ is that forgiveness is a vital thing that Christ offers of God saying somewhere along the way since creation was made and it was good, something got a little off. Be it the free will of humanity choosing our own way and bringing harm to us and God and one another and needing forgiveness and reconciliation for those sins. Be it a static of communication that we no longer hear God clearly most of the time because we don't want to. Be it a distance of exile that we are not at home in this world that was made good And Christ can bring us forgiveness. Christ brings us home. Christ brings clarity in that communication between us and God. We call these atonement theories that for some people it's about the way Christ lived and that makes us right and at one with God. For some people it's about how Christ died and that makes it right and makes us one with God. For some people it's about the empty tomb and that love wins and death doesn't win and that makes us at one with God. I'm a believer that I need all of it. I'm not a believer in just one atonement theory and just one way that Jesus works to make us right with God. I'm a believer that I need the whole mystery and bigness of it all of Christ's life, his death, and his resurrection. Because I know I'm in need of that clear communication, of that sense of home, of that sense of grace and forgiveness in my life. Where else do I need to offer that forgiveness? Where else do I need to forgive debts? Where else do I need to return what is rightfully someone else's? Where else do I need to forgive and be made whole? I think there are some places in our world that we probably will not get figured out in this life. And that's why we need Jesus' hope for a life beyond ours. That the systems of oppression, of racism, of economic disparity, of homophobia and sexism, we may not see the solutions to those in our lifetime, but man, I want to work for it every day to make those things right But I know that in the mystery and power of God who made everything, in the work of Christ who is God in our neighborhood and is not leaving us the way he found us, 
that in the big picture of things, God is going to make it all new, that Christ is going to help us forgive one another and make us reconciled across our fears and our hatred and our pains and our own personal anxieties and sins. Those are the ways that Christ, for me, is that compassion, that Christ is that uniter, that Christ is that faith and grace and hope and teacher and example. Maybe Christ singing that song of God's unconditional community and unconditional love of God offering us that song in Christ gives us just a glimpse now of what healing and restoration across all of these deep, deep wounds might look like. Maybe we get a glimpse of it in the moments where we share a little grace. Maybe we get a glimpse of it here and now whenever we welcome someone who is not like me. Maybe we get a glimpse of it now when we extend the table further in feeding and healing and in welcoming and in forgiving. We get just a taste now of what life in God is about in that community of God, by that community of God, for that community of God, in that love of God, by that love of God, for that love of God. God has moved into the neighborhood and is with us and among us still. We talk about the church being the body of Christ. We are the hands and feet of Christ now among us. We will share this meal not just to remember Christ, but to be put together as the members of Christ's body, like the arms and legs and hands and feet of Christ's body. God shows us what God is like in Christ, and we get to show the world what God is like as the body of Christ when we go from this place every week.